Well, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. What a fantastic crowd. I just want to make a little note for folks in the back. There are three available seats up here. Don't be afraid to sit in the front row. I can promise you these authors won't bite. All right. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. My name is Amali and I'm the events director here at Books Are Magic. We are so excited to have Dan Coyce and Taffy Bredeser Ackner with us tonight to celebrate the launch of Dan's debut novel, Vintage Contemporaries. But yes. <laughs> but before we get into all of that, I just have a few logistics to point out uh, for how tonight's event is going to go. First off, we do ask that you keep your mask on at all times while at this event. We will be doing a hand-raised audience Q&A towards the end of the discussion, so please start thinking of questions to ask and hold on to them. After the talk tonight, Dan will be signing and personalizing books at the table next to where you checked in. We'll let you know when and where to start lining up for that. And lastly, if you're joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we'd love to encourage you to buy a copy of Vintage Contemporaries online using the link in the live stream description. Vintage Contemporaries paints a stunning picture of the NYC publishing world in the 90s with a heartwarming and wrenching friendship in the center of it all. As Danielle Evans writes, this novel provides precise insight into the defining moments of youth and adulthood and finds grace and abundant possibility in both. Dan Coyce is a writer, editor, and podcaster at Slate, where he's been nominated for two National Magazine Awards. He's the author of How to Be a Family, a memoir of parenting around the world, and the co-author with Isaac Butler of The World Only Spins Forward, an oral history of Tony Kushner's Angels in America, which was a 2019 Stonewall honor book. He lives with his family in Arlington, Virginia. And as I mentioned earlier, Taffy Brodesser Ackner joins Yay! Dan in conversation tonight. <laughs> Dan, is, I mean Taffy, sorry, is a staff writer at the, New, at the New York Times Magazine and is the author of the New York Times bestselling novel, Fleischman is in Trouble, which was long listed for the National Book Award, the Women's Prize, and several other awards. Her second novel, Long Island Compromise, will be published by Random House this coming year. All right, that's all for me. Without any further delay, please join me in welcoming Dan and Taffy. Yeah. Give it up for Taffy Brothers or Actor, folks. And for Sorry, I need a little more slack in that cord. Welcome, everybody. I want you to know if you do not work at Slate, you are not alone. <laughs> not everybody here works at Slate. Just the majority just a, of people just, here. There are a couple of us. Did, there do are or did three work of us. at Slate? Yes. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming out. It is so heartening to see people gathered. Um, and I'm pretending you all don't have masks on. Mm -hmm. So it's the equivalent of pretending people are naked. Um, thank you for coming out to celebrate this incredible debut novel, novel Vintage Contemporaries, which, yes, yes. Um, first, I just, wanna, I just wanna make a bid for you to buy this book, if you haven't already. Um, I, I loved this book. This book felt like the best kind of novel to me. It felt like a friend. And every night that I was reading it during a, during a pretty busy time, it drew me in, it brought me into a place, it, it reminded me of everything. And it is, it is, it is truly, truly beautiful. It is funny. It is, it is kind. It is big hearted. Um, and I, um, I'm going to make sure you each buy one. So <laughs> she's gonna be at the door on the way out, like just, just checking your bag. Stop resisting. It's it's gonna happen. Um, so I'm going to start by asking uh, Dan to describe the book. Uh, I have been describing it as uh, a a comedy about broken friendships. Um, it's set in the 90s and the 2000s. It's set sort of in the publishing world and the art world. It's set in New York, and it's about a group of friends who fall apart for different reasons and then come together for other reasons. 
And the and a very interesting the first interesting thing you'll notice about it is that it is um, it is it has two it has a female protagonist and the friendship it describes is a female friendship. And I kind of think, you know, I, I've been asked a lot in, in, in my career, like, how do you write about men? And I, my answer is, it, it's actually quite easy. Um, <laughs> imagine a woman, but free, is what I always say. But, but what, this seemed like a real feat. This seemed to me like a like a real kind of miracle it reminded me of a bunch of friendships i've had the kind that you have when you first move to new york um it's a it's a book that um is about book publishing also but it's about this friendship that starts out um in the 90s in new york the lower east side back when manhattan actually people used to live in manhattan <laughs> um in that in that duane reed we call manhattan and <laughs> Um, I guess I guess I'm just gonna admit what a basic I am and ask you like why did you write from the point of view of these women and how did you do it so well? Uh, thank you, Taffy, for coming uh, here. I'm really I'm so happy that you're here and I'm so happy that everyone is here. Um, I the there's two reasons that this ended up being a book uh, with women at the center of it, and the first was extremely basic, befitting your basic question, thank you. Um, which was that. I, this book came about because I turned 40 and had a midlife crisis about how I had not written any fiction at all, even though I ostensibly had a master's degree in writing fiction, um, that had gone so badly that it had scared me off of writing fiction for like 18 years. Um, and so I basically every night when my kids would go to bed at, you know, 1045 or whatever out on the porch, I would just basically do a Linda Berry writing exercise to get something on the page that was not my own life but was other people and other characters in my imagination. And so it's, I started writing about women because it was like a very simple kludge that allowed me to remind myself every single night without having to do a bunch of extra work that I'm not writing about me. I'm writing about other people who are not me. How do I know? Oh, look, they're a completely different gender from me. Um, <laughs> uh, and so then I could go from there. And I found that very useful because I, I didn't have any real faith in what I was doing or that what I was doing was going to turn into anything. And I didn't even really have a sense that I could do it. So I wanted to make it as easy as possible for myself. Um, so that's like the, the basic, like structural reason why I did that. And, but then as it started to seem like a thing after a couple of years, as I started to think, okay, well, if this was a book, what kind of, what book would it be? Um, it seemed to me that a lot of the issues that I was writing about, a lot of the themes of the book um, about friendship, um, about workplace problems, workplace uh, uh, exploitation, and um, and uh, workplace authority would be way more interesting if women were at the center of those stories uh, than if, like a guy like me, was at the center of the, those stories. Because I, and maybe it's simply because it's different from my perspective. But I just found it so much more fun to explore those ideas uh, over the last three decades in the in the voices of women because I have watched so many women in my life uh, deal with questions like this and struggle with them uh, and and come to terms with the, the new world we are living in and the old world that we were once in. That's very interesting because one of the one of the other things to recommend in this book is how how respectfully and how smart it assumes that its reader is. And its first example of that is that both of the friends in this novel have the same first name, <laughs> which some people would say could be confusing, but sure. actually. <laughs> like if you work for Kirkus Reviews, for example. Right. Yeah, you might find that confusing and, and off-putting. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, some people, mm -hmm. some people. Um, and it is, it's so interesting because the thing you're saying is, it is this coming of age novel. And the first novel that's a coming of age novel, I can't even think of a time where you could not hook who the person, like who the author is in the book. And here we are with these two young women named Emily, one who is an assistant um, at, an, at a literary agency, and the other who is an aspiring 
artist who lives on a lower in the Lower East Side squat where there are now Whole Foods. Again, before before the Lower East Side was in, you couldn't even visit it without paying a lot. Um, it was considered a it was a considered a place where you know people who couldn't make their rent lived. It was considered. Um, it was a place for artists. It was a place, was a place that place artists, artists could live, make art, and have a life that supported that because there was no infrastructure and so there was no requirement to pay into it in order to be able to afford that. Not anymore. Um, why did you give them both the same name? Well, that was a, an, an error. <laughs> it turned did, out. Did, did it get updated? Because I read it again. <laughs> we just did it. We did a find and replace, but then it didn't work. <laughs> Uh, no, I, it seemed to me, um, I, I have a, a somewhat common name for my generation. There were a lot of Daniels uh, in my grade school class, and of course, we, one was a Dan, and one was a Daniel, and one was a Danny. Um, and I've had the experience of having very good friends over the course of my life with a similar name to me, and I know that that has happened to a lot of people. And, and it seemed to me what a gift to have this extremely, almost blunt object metaphor for the way that friendships in your 20s become less about uh, each individual person and more about the unit you make, the two of you, uh, which is both beautiful and sort of annihilating. Uh, like you just, you disappear into one another. Um, and I love that and also recognize that it's not exactly healthy necessarily uh, at that age. Um, but I, I just thought, oh, they, they're going to become part of a unit anyway. How much fun would it be to give them the same name, not thinking about the years of copy editing that would follow. Right, or the, the, that there's, carcass. There's, like, at you know, least, carcass. there's at least three, in that galley you're holding, there's at least three Emily M. errors. I caught them. Uh, yes. <laughs> I caught those. This is not the place for that. Alice. But <laughs> it's possible there's still some in the book, and if so, they were intentional. They're a device <laughs> that I'm using to, to make sure that you really understand. Um, so... Um, the Emily protagonist, the one that we are with, t we hear her story. Main Emily is Main what Emily. we call her in edit. Main Emily. And then there's other Emily. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Because for a while, um, other Emily sort of, you know, bigfoots her and says, you'll be called M. And there is a part of the book, um, is this a spoiler, where, it's a, no. <laughs> where, they, where they meet again many years later as you do with the friend who annihilated you, ate you up, and then later you're like, what was so wrong with that? Oh, right. Um, and she, and the em and the Emily, who was the M, just says, no, I'm now called Emily. I thought that was very beautiful. Um, but you see how hard it is to explain out loud. So <laughs> I think I'm, I'm, I'm going against what I was trying to do, which is sell you this book. Please, don't listen to me. Um, one of the first books that Maine Emily discovers is the is the sort of commercial fiction, these maybe soft romance of an older writer that um, she knows through her mother. Um, and as the book goes on, we tell the story gets told out of order. It goes from 1991 to 2005 yeah. to 1993 Three. to 2007. Yeah. Okay. And we should have worked that out beforehand. <laughs> um, I want to know what this woman who is who is who is determined to not write unpleasantness meant to you because what we what we find is that it's hard to sell her books because there is no there's no tragedy and there's no sick character. There's barely even any conflict. There's any, barely yeah. any, and then of course that woman becomes <coughs> the conflict in the book. Um, what are you trying to say about? Um, what a book should be. Uh, well, I mean, you asked, sort you sort of mentioned that in a lot of coming-of-age novels, there's a character who's very easily peggable to the person who wrote it. And in the end, for me, the person who, who felt the most like me in terms of this particular issue was her, was Lucy, the older writer who is who has a kid who's growing up who really wants to be doing the kind of writing she wishes she was doing, but who simply does not have it in her anymore to write unpleasant uh, things to write unhappiness. Um, and when you're writing a book, having freshly turned 40, only at 10.45 p.m., uh, working a very um, challenging but wonderful day job at Slate.com, <laughs> um, you also, I found, 
I every time that I started writing something that was filled with a lot of conflict or anger uh, or that seemed like a thing that the characters couldn't get back from, my whole body was like, fuck that. Wow. I do not want to do that. And so I ended up wanting to, I ended up finding my way into this book in which there just isn't that much conflict um, and where problems that people have get resolved in, uh, in very pleasant and happy ways. Um, and it ended up being, for me, an exploration of happiness, which is something I care a lot about and think a lot about, but that I haven't necessarily read a lot about. Which ends up being devastating because you finish the book realizing you've read about about happiness, and for some reason that kneecaps you more than anything. I don't, I don't really understand it, but you did a good job. Um, I am going to say that it is a it is a great insult that um, once main Emily has a has is married and she has a child and she has a job, she has the same sort of conflict that I know that every woman I know has dealt with. And there's this very, very beautiful passage that I'm going to ask Dan to read. It's on page, it's the last part of page 100. You got it. it. You mm -hmm. got it because we talked before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dan, we talked before. Um, and the insult is, is that he gets it so right. So please listen to this. Uh, this happens in 2005 and this is after she has reconnected uh, with other Emily, the friend who she broke up with in the 90s. Um, and, uh, and she's starting to find her way back into her life and trying to figure out what role she could play. And um, it happens late at night. She gently, she gently dumped her sleeping daughter back into the crib, Jane's brand new curls sticking to her sweaty forehead. She left a hand on the girl's stomach, slipped an index finger in between the buttons of her pajamas to feel her smooth, round tummy. Jane stirred, cooed, stayed asleep. Part of her was here with Jane, feeling the baby's pulse as her own. Part of her was building ideas about Chekhov in the subway. Part of her was with Peter, her boss, steering him, making the most out of his particular genius. Part of her was with Lucy's books, guiding them slowly through the machine so at the other end they would come out as she'd imagined them. Part of her was in bed with Alan, curled into his apostrophe in the dark. She knew that later she would feel doubts, she would feel frightened, but at this moment, she thought she might be big enough. She might have enough within her to be all those things at once. Right? His apostrophe. <laughs> That's very, very beautiful. Um, so it, it, the, the details of the time in New York are, <laughs> are really interesting. It's everything from Angels in America, which you've written, you've co-written a book about, um, and, and book publishing and male bosses who, who you don't think are harassing you. They're just kind of tough people. And then only later does someone younger than you tell you that actually you've been harassed the whole time. Um, and another thing it deals with is exploitation. Um, it would be, we would be remiss if we did not mention that this was a HarperCollins book, mm -hmm. that we are amid a HarperCollins strike. Is there anything you would like to note about that? Uh, Your pen. He's wearing a pen. I'm wearing a pen. Can't um, see. Uh, he's wearing uh, a pen. Uh, <laughs> I, it, it has been weird, and I'm really happy that um, th that the people I have worked with on this book from Harper are here. Um, some of them are in the union, and some of them are too senior to be in the union. Um, but I have so enjoyed the process of working with Harper Collins, and I've loved every single person I've worked with, and I've hated that as this book is coming out, 200 of their employees are striking, and the company is not bargaining with them and that is driving me a little bit nuts. Um, so I would just want to urge everyone here to please um, support the HarperCollins strikers and the union. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, donate to the strike fund uh, for each book that gets sold here tonight. Um, each of my books, if you buy Taffy's book, they don't get shit. Um, you have to give me five dollars. That's right. Um, but uh, I just would really urge everyone to, if you don't know about the strike, please read about it and find out about it and do what you can to support them because they are the reason that these books are so good, um, that the books that HarperCollins publishes are so good, and um, I really want them to be able to go back to work. Now that we've talked about that, here's a funny section of the book on page 214. I just wanted, um, I just wanted us to read this because it made me laugh twice. Uh, 
And I, I really recommend like, having a hype man. It's very, it's like great <laughs> having a hype man he on gave stage me with this you. $5 already. That's right. <laughs> Uh, okay, this um, scene takes place in the 90s, and it's um, em Emily and Emily and their friends meeting uh, Emily's big sister, who is a real estate agent in uh, Wisconsin. Um, uh, but they've come out to New York, her and her boring husband, um, to, uh, to, you know, see the Big Apple. To the Big Apple, Mark said. <laughs> to my big sister, Em added. Anne-Marie smiled. You know, Emily announced, drying her hair with paper towels. She came in from the rain, but she doesn't own an umbrella. The name The Big Apple comes from a whorehouse. She had their attention and continued happily. Yeah, there was a brothel down in the Bowery in the 1800s. The woman who ran it was named Eve, Eve something. She was French, very fancy. She liked to call her girls Eve's Apples. So then when people called New York The Big Apple, it was usually disparaging, the city of whorehouses. I suppose that's not how you meant it. She looked at Mark. <laughs> who are you? This is Emily, Em said into the silence of the room and introduced her sister and her husband. Did you lose your umbrella? She asked. You're drenched. Who the fuck carries an umbrella around? Said Emily. <laughs> That's fascinating about the Big Apple, Mark said. Where did you read that? Emily shrugged. I've done a lot of research for a piece I'm working on that's about New York history, but that's just a thing that New Yorkers know. <laughs> it wasn't a thing that Em knew. For years afterwards, she would bring this amazing fact up in conversation at parties until a historian told her it was completely untrue. <laughs> All this and more in this book that you should buy. Um, the book, as we mentioned, is told out of order so that by the time um, you meet um, M, who is now Emily, and she's married and she is senior in a different in a in, at a different book publishing house. Um, by the time you meet her there, she, um, she is not friends with Emily anymore, but you don't know why. She's married, but you don't know to whom, and she has a new baby. Um, how did you decide, I found that the way you told it out of order very affecting, but I can't quite figure out why it's so affecting. What was your, what was the principle of what you were thinking when you put things out of order? Uh, part of it was extremely mercenary and that I felt if I had was committing to writing a book without conflict, I wanted for people to at least feel suspense of any kind. <laughs> Even if it was artificially manufactured suspense of the we just jump forward 14 years and you don't know everything variety. Um, and that was maybe like my editor brain freaking out a little bit about the thing that I was writing and whether it would actually, people would want to continue through it. Um, but it also came, I mean, it also came literally from, I stole it from another book, um, which is a book I really love by a New Zealand author uh, named Pip Adam, um, who I who is a great genius, who's finally just being published in this country later this year um, by the uh, by Dorothy, a publishing project. Um, but she has a book uh, um, uh, that, that does basically the same thing, that leaps forward in time, leaps forward in time, and then backs up again, and then leaps forward in time. And I found that so affecting because it allowed me to sort of keep the entire kaleidoscope of these characters' lives in mind as I was reading every individual part. Um, as, as I leapt forward into the future, it forced me to think about the past. As I leapt back into the past again, then it put all those different versions of these characters in my head. Um, and it made, it, it made reading it particularly fun, um, just as like a, a tiny bit of a puzzle, but also um, it increased my emotional connection with those people. Uh, I felt like I really knew them, um, and I so I swiped it. That's good. It's always it's good to steal. Um, if the book has a thesis about about friendship, what is that? <laughs> uh, it doesn't. <laughs> um, I it's to me it ended up mostly being about the value of those friends. Uh, we make in our 20s, as you have written about, um, that the people, the friends we make in college are the ones that we will basically stick with no matter what. Um, uh, and that is usually true. It isn't always true, though. Sometimes we fall out. Um, so it, it felt like I wanted to write about those kinds of friendships, those annihilating friendships, but the ones that are so defining. And I wanted to write about what happens when you, as an a actual grown person, um, start to think about the person you once were and the friendships you once had and the places you once worked, but start to think about, all right, 
if I'm now a grown up with a kid and a different job and a whole bunch of different concerns, but I still want this person in my life, what's the version of this friendship that that is like doable, that is that helps us both and is healthy for us both and is meaningful and loving, um, but does not necessarily destroy me. Um, that's not really a thesis, but I guess it's yes, it is. your friendships don't have to destroy you necessarily. Disagree. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dan, I've heard enough. I would like to buy this book. Is it available in this store? Uh, it is, yes. I am Jordana, gonna... would you please hold up that copy for everyone Amazing. to see? Thank Guys, you. Guys, there's so many of them yeah. here. Um, I am going to, I've, I've had my curiosities satisfied. I would love to hear if anybody else has any questions here. Come on. I know I'm good, but I'm not that. Oh, hello, hey. Isaac. Oh, hey. Um, I have more of a comment than no. I, um, uh, the, um, the book has a really fascinating relationship to coolness and to like kind of hipness. It, it, and it starts in sort of one of the most cool, milieu, the very mythologized milieus of a squad on the Lower East Side just before the Tompkins Square riots. And I, I just thought, I, I was wondering about sort of the evolving relationship the characters have to that and, and, and how you thought about that while you were writing the book. I'm going to repeat the question. Oh, that's for a good our idea. friends at home. Um, Isaac has a problem with projection. He's not. Yeah. He's, I also, I also he's never to know, been theatrically he trained. He was supposed to do that in a, in a funny accent. I also want your favorite uh, vintage contemporary color. Okay. Oh, yeah. two part question. Two part question. The first is, uh, what is the evolving the character's evolving relationship with coolness, and the second is, what is your favorite vintage contemporary cover? Uh, the character's evolving relationship to coolness exactly mirrors mine, which is that <laughs> as I became less cool, I realized somehow that being cool doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and my favorite uh, vintage contemporary is the worst one, Barry Hanna's Airships, <laughs> the cover of which is an aircraft carrier from which a fighter jet is taking off into the sky, but the fighter jet is an upside down saxophone with wings. It sounds nice. Great book. Great book. Does anybody else have questions? Yes. Yes. Oh, hey. You so beautifully evoke uh, New York in the 90s, a time that is dear to my heart, and so I hope so many people here. I'm wondering if it was just like free associative, and it's, or if there was any actual research involved. Like, is this, was it just like, I remember myself in this way, or did you actually like <laughs> go down and like, that's what these ashtrays look like? The question is, mm -hmm. um, did you have to do research to remember the 90s? Or did you? <laughs> or, 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 or was this uh, was this stuff that was at your fingertips? Or that I just fucking made up. Or that, or that you made up. Um, I, I, like many people my age, I basically still live in the 90s. Yeah. Um, so, a, so a, a lot of it came to hand, although the era of the book is before I had ever really spent much time in New York. And the first time I spent any real time in New York was 1994, um, uh, uh, a little bit after the action of the book. But, um, did you live here? I lived here for one summer as a, uh, very bad student of the NYU summer film program, um, in, in which I made a bunch of quite terrible short films. Um, and one of the other students in the program was a guy who was in the movie New Jack City. Um, and everyone wanted him to be in their projects. And he, keep, he kept having to patiently explain that he wasn't allowed to do that because of union yeah. rules. Yeah. yeah. But we didn't get it. We just thought he was a dick. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I lived in the, on the Lower East Side at that time. Um, and I was quite clueless, in fact, to basically to, for example, the hipness of that neighborhood, the kind of artistic ferment uh, and political ferment that was happening there. Um, I was just worried about getting to NYU and um, and making my bad movies and uh, not having any money. Um, and so, uh, so there was a lot of stuff I didn't know anything about at all because I wasn't paying attention when I was there because I was dumb. Um, and so, yeah, I did a lot of reading, a lot of research. I um, a, a research particularly about the squats um, uh, at the Lower East Side, which is a rich topic that has been written about by a bunch of 
people who lived there at the time um, and by a great oral history researcher at Columbia named Amy Staracheski, who wrote a great book called Ours to Lose. Um, and, uh, and that was really fun because it allowed me to use what I found uh, and then to feel confident in making crap up like I don't actually remember what kind of glasses they used at the Selka. Right. But it was fun to make that stuff up and feel like, well, I've seen a bunch of pictures of the Selka and I can at least make up something that that someone will find convincing if they don't look too carefully. Don't look too carefully, kids. A lesson about all novels, honestly. You have a question. Dan, did you ever consider writing from other Emily's perspective? Uh, yes, and I did a lot of it, um, especially in the first couple of years when, the, when, as I said, the book was just sort of a series of exercises um, that I was throwing at the page. Uh, I wrote uh, from everyone's perspective, and, um, and, I, and I really liked a lot of that material, but then also found that as is was the case in the characters lives every time i wrote from her sp perspective it completely fucking took over the book uh and it introduced an enormous amount of conflict misery and anger <laughs> into the story which was not what i actually wanted um and so uh and so i like scrapped it all but i mean it was very useful in like the boring classical you know i i feel like i understand her better because i did this but in the same way that um, in, the, in the book, when Emily um, first encounters Lucy's novel, the older woman's novel, um, she, she too complains that it, shouldn't it just be a little more exciting and shouldn't the characters have more bad things happen to them? And couldn't the really fun character, who's like a real spark plug, couldn't there be like five more scenes of her? Maybe you should just do the whole novel as her? Um, and Lucy has to be like, no, that's not, I, and then it's a totally different novel and, and it's, it's not the thing that I'm writing. And so I sort of had to make that decision at some point that she probably deserves a story of her own, but that, but I couldn't write that right now. Unpleasant. But in the vintage contemporary cinematic universe, she gets the first spinoff movie. She sues Emily, me and Emily. I'm calling on people. Thank How did you. you write? Too late. How did you write most of this book after 10:45? The question is, how did you write most of this book after 10:45? Um, I would just generally not work very hard at my job <laughs> to reserve my energy. Uh, no, I just didn't do a lot. It was literally like half an hour and then I would stop. And it, what that leaves you with is just like an enormous number of Google Docs with, you know, with names like, I don't know, or what the fuck, or <laughs> some bullshit. Um, uh... But yeah, so what I did at 1045 at night basically was write an enormous amount of material that at some point I had to like turn on my editor brain and say, okay, what, what is it? What is the book? Um, and, uh, and so yeah, I think that's the only way to do it. And, I, and to be very clear, I do not recommend this as a way to write a book. Uh, it took forever and it was a big pain in the ass. How long did it take? Uh, uh, well, I'm now 48. Uh, and I started it when I turned 40, so, wow. yeah. Okay. So don't do that. Lizzie, I'm calling up. Lizzie. Okay, yeah. Lizzie. Thank, thank you. <laughs> when did you know that you had a novel in that process? And, and was that frightening? No, oh my God, it was such I'm a relief. Repeat oh, please question. repeat the question. <laughs> when did you know you had a novel, and was it frightening? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, it was like four years in when I when I basically set aside some time and read everything I had and uh, like applied editor brain to it um, and mapped it out. And I, it wasn't even that I knew I had a novel. It was that I forced it into the shape of a novel, trusting that I then could fix the things that were wrong with it further down the line. And that meant abandoning some stuff and knowing I was going to have to rewrite some stuff, and knowing that this thing that I'd written, which was from one character's perspective, actually shouldn't be from her perspective at all, and figuring out, oh, it looks like this novel takes place in two completely different time periods, and I better figure out a way to deal with that. Um, but yeah, so it was a huge relief to, to think, oh, I can make this into something 
it's not just a thing that I've been spending half an hour on a night, every night, forever, for no purpose whatsoever. Are there any other questions I, I can call on? <laughs> yes. So just to continue, so at that point, do you, you just have like this cobbled together like mess of mismatch that you then have to like sand and smooth down to like all fitting together or how to add? So at this point, mm -hmm. you now have a bunch of documents that you have to smooth together and sand down. You said that so beautifully. I'm sorry I can't <laughs> replicate that. Is that what happened then? Basically, yeah. I mean, yeah. so it was, uh, it, it was then basically figuring out, all right, what's the first section of this book? What are the, what are the chunks I've written that fit in here? What is all the connecting tissue that's missing? How did she get here? Why is she here? Who are these people to her? Um, what are the scenes that go in the middle that actually tell you things you need to know about her? Why did I mention a sister, but she's nowhere in anywhere else in the entire thing? I better write some scenes about the sister. Um, so yeah, it was like very, it was fun work, but it was not like the inspirational flowing novel from point A to point Z that I had always dreamed of writing. It was more like I had a bunch of bricks um, and some of the bricks were pretty good. And then I put them together to try and build something and then parts of it fell over and then I had to take those bricks and put them in a different place. Um, so yeah, again, I don't recommend this method. <laughs> um, Allison. Okay, so you can tell me if this is a total misreading of the book, but one, you know, Emily leads, ends up leading like a fairly conventional life. She has like a good job and she has a kid and she has a, a spouse and she's happy. Um, and M, who you, oh no, I'm sorry, I've got it wrong. Shit. Emily. Once again, <laughs> coming back to bite. You can't bite. get it wrong. You can't get it wrong. Main <laughs> Emily and other Emily. Yeah. Uh, and Emily, other Emily struggles, and you don't get, you, we don't hear from her perspective as you're noting, but like she has a drug problem, and you're not sure at the end of the book, like how she's, you know, how it's going to go for her. She's like leading a more unconventional life. So for me, because it's very validating to take away as like a conventional life. <laughs> Is this book partisan to a conventional life? Uh, I wrote this book as a way of reassuring Allison that it was okay to move to New Jersey. Thank you, because she wrote the opposite. Um, My book's for sale. I will say, I don't... My, I, I, other Emily definitely, <laughs> perhaps you've heard of it. Um, uh, I, em, other Emily definitely leads a much less conventional life, but to my mind, at least, or at least as I wanted to write her, she seems to have figured out a way to do it that makes her happy by the end of the book and, and finding a way to for reforge a friendship with Maine Emily has also helped make her happy. Um, and, and she has success. And she has some yeah. measure of success. Not the, not the kind of success she thought she was destined for, but a kind of artistic success. She's making things that she loves that are good with people she cares about. Um, and uh, and I, I hope that people walk out of the book feeling, walk out of the book. <laughs> <laughs> When it's a TV show, <laughs> like Taffy's book. Um, no, I hope that people finish the book feeling like, oh, I think probably they're both going to be all right. Um, and that there are, that a conventional and an unconventional life can both lead you to being pretty happy in different ways, uh, as long as y your, what you actually want out of them matches the things that it can give you. Okay. And were they getting, were those brains getting angry at each other when they were making changes, or did it sort of meld together and you kind of went forward from there? Tell us about the war between the two brains you have, <laughs> one as a writer and one as an editor. Uh, great question, thank you. Um, 
I found a rhythm eventually in being able to like write freely and enjoy the stuff I was writing and then immediately look at it and figure out all right is a job doing the job that it's supposed to do. Um, I don't know that it was 100% successful. Definitely a lot of that stuff when an actual real good editor got her hands on it changed or got fixed or she was like, why is this here? Um, but I found that I was able for the most part to like be creative when I needed to be creative and be ruthless when I needed to be ruthless, at least in terms of figuring out, well, what is missing? I'm not, I wasn't ruthless enough probably in terms of, oh, we probably don't need that scene. And there was one more question. I saw it in the back. Someone had one more question. Oh, Emily in the front. Okay. This Emily. Mm -hmm. Main <laughs> Emily. Third Emily. Third Emily. Uh, what was so horrible about the writing program you were in? What, oh, 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 oh. what was so horrible <laughs> about the NYU I just, No, I was just, I was just interested because I was also... I no, no, that was different. That was a summer film program. I did, I had an, I, it was my MFA is what she's asking. Oh, about. what was yeah. so wrong with your MFA yeah, well, program? Yeah, because, I mean, I was, I also went to a writing program and so I'm always very curious about people's bad experiences with writing programs. Uh, I made a number of mistakes going into that MFA program. Um, one was that I was too young. Uh, I one and I didn't really have anything to write about yet. One was that I had a very specific idea of what kind of book I would write if I was like a writer. Um, another was that I didn't go to a funded program. Mm -hmm. So I worked all the way through the program and took out a bunch of loans. Um, and, uh, and so I think the program itself was probably a pretty good program, but I was spectacularly ill-suited to take advantage of it or produce anything good. And so I finished it by like botching an attempt at a novel, like a serious, intense, cool novel, um, and you know, working on it for a year, which mostly was like staring at it in agony, um, and then just like publishing a bunch of workshop stories as my thesis uh, after a, a full year after I was supposed to graduate, and then feeling at the end of it like, well, I guess I, have, I guess I have, I'm not a fiction writer after all. If I can't write the kind of book that 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 fiction writers write then I'm not a fiction writer. Um, so yeah, I would not really put the blame at the feet of the MFA program, though it would have been great if they hadn't charged me so much money. <laughs> um, but, uh, but mostly it was that I, I basically did all, everything wrong you can do going into a program like that. Well, Dan, you showed you. I sure did. <laughs> Fuck that guy, 22 year old me who doesn't know shit. Again, thank you everybody for coming. This is such a beautiful book and it's been a real gift to read it early, to talk to you about it, to ask all of my questions and to hear your great questions. Thank you all for coming. Please buy it. Yeah. Give it up for Taffy Brunner's actor. I'm just going to pop a for one more note. Again, as I mentioned earlier, Dan will be signing and personalizing books. At the desk, my coworker Christina in the back is going to point right now to where he's gonna be signing. So we ask that you all kind of form an orderly line along the width of the store and then going down this bookshelf on this side. That way our staff can start to break down and rearrange the store so that we're ready to open at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Also, we have plenty of copies of Fleischman is in Trouble um, available tonight as well. And if you ask Kathy very nicely, she will probably sign it for you. Um, that's all. Thank you all so much for coming out. And let's give these two one last round of applause. Kathy will also sign my book if you ask her. <laughs>